This morning's message comes from the book of Acts, chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 21 and going down through verse 41. Acts 19, 21 through 41. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia to go to, and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who had made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, that Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that the gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioned with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If, therefore, Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. This is God's word. <clears throat> and again, um, straight away after the service, we'll have that brief meeting regarding the work to be done in whole. At this point, I want to thank you all for coming out, for being a part of a service together in the name of Jesus. Our attention turns to Acts chapter 19, 21 through 41. Having been read by Pastor Joel, we, we examine it, and we see that there are three scenes, mainly 21 through 27. 28 through 34 and 35 through 41. A scene in a narrative contains a a, a particular truth. We call that the divine comment. 
we can have one that binds the whole passage together, but there would appear to be a few here in this text. And so we will address this in that manner. Three scenes, one narrative, three points. Last time, after the incident involving the sons of Sceva in uh, Acts 19, and the good news of verse 20, which reads as this, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. After that wonderful news, we enter into verse 21. And this speaks to the riot in Ephesus. Paul later on in his writings refers to the fact that he, he battled wild beasts in Ephesus and it's likely that he's referring to this incident here, the battling of wild beasts, not speaking uh, literally, and, but uh, in, a, in a, uh, a figurative manner describing what it was like in Ephesus when he did his ministry. So this is the riot that took place. We're going to look at it today, and we're going to talk about opposition to the gospel, the nature of this opposition. And once we have established that in application and through the text, we're going to do one major application. So we're going to look at the three scenes, come out with three points relating to gospel opposition. What is its nature? What is it like? This isn't... Uh, uh, a final picture because there are many other aspects we can't get to, but the text will give us a few aspects of gospel opposition and then one major application that we'll take into our lives. So that's where we're going here in the text. Let's go to prayer and ask God for wisdom. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege that it has been to participate with the saints today. Uh, on this Sunday, on this day of worship. We are thankful for the grace that you have provided us so that we can gather and that we can celebrate together. I thank you for the ministry of music today, the ministry of prayer, and all the other ministries that have gone into this, this morning. Thank you for those who do such work. We pray, to, I pray today as chaplain prayed earlier that we might, that whatever I say, that you would help me to say that which glorifies you and benefits the saints, that you would stop things that aren't to be said, that you would keep me from folly, and that you would uh, help me in this moment to address truth Lord, I pray these things because I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit who even uses sinful people yet saved like me. Help me, Lord, this weak vessel to be used of you. Bless us all through your word and we pray it in the name of the Fa Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The church has always faced opposition. Sometimes it's been quite intense, and other times in church history, uh, not so much. And the church has responded well in, in uh, many cases, and in others, not so much. So today we want to identify certain qualities of gospel opposition. Now, there is opposition to the gospel today. We know that. But we want to... to look for a way forward. We don't want to stay under, under a, <clears throat> a form of, of self-imposed oppression. We want to look at these qualities of opposition to the gospel and then develop a way ahead, even in evil times like these. <clears throat> we live in an evil era, and uh, we are facing more and more confusion, it seems, every day. And so we want to develop a way ahead so that we might continue the ministry and do it to God's glory. So the question we're gonna talk about today is this, what are some of the qualities of opposition? That is gospel opposition. And you're gonna face it, I'll face it in the days ahead, and you probably have at the workplace, at school, etc. Gospel opposition is very real. And yet, there is a way forward, and we learn from our text at least one way, and I think it's central. 
So let us begin. What are some of the qualities of gospel opposition? Gospel opposition can be, and often is, material. Material, M-A-T-E-R-I-A-L, referring to, <clears throat> when I say material, I'm referring to lifestyle, lifestyle that is in union with something else. And in this text, it's something religious. So lifestyle in the context of religion. But we call it material. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 21 says, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So Paul is planning his, his journeys. He'll end up in Rome, and uh, he will proclaim the gospel there. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Now the text suddenly leaps forward. About that time, so when Paul was still in Asia, and he's planning his trip, about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. Luke is writing, and he's using this Greek mechanism. When he says no little disturbance, he means that there was a big disturbance. So what is this big disturbance? Here it is. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis. So in the ancient world, <clears throat> the goddess Artemis, who would be the equivalent in, in uh, ancient Rome would be Diana. And um, this Artemis would be the goddess of the hunt of wild animals, of chastity and the moon. So quite a bit involved there, but mainly the goddess of the hunt. So Artemis and the equivalent in Roman mythology would be uh, Diana. So Artemis is being worshipped here in Ephesus, a great big uh, display for her, this worship place. And there are artisans who make, who make uh, images of this shrine. We still have this kind of thing going on in the modern era among pagan religions, so it's not a surprise to us. Verse 25, there he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but almost all of Asia, this Paul, see now, uh, has persuaded and turned away a great many people. It is interesting how the providence of God works. But we know that Paul is doing a great job because Demetrius is really ticked off at him. And we know here in the passage that he's doing very well by the power of the Holy Spirit because he's turning a great many people away from paganism, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. That's true. We said that back in Acts 17, for instance. Gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. Now he links lifestyle. You know, they're making these images, and Paul comes along, shares the gospel, and the market shrinks. <laughs> you know, you, hey, he can't take that away from us. We need Artemis. We need this goddess in order to make money, and lots of it too. And then he links it with the religion itself. Remember, there are many cultures that are intertwined with pagan religions, even in the modern era. Cultures that are intertwined with paganism. Saw it in the ancient world, see it today. He writes, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. In other words, if Paul is, keeps going, we'll lose our money and we'll lose our entire culture because it's all intertwined. 
Now just try to, if you were, let's say, a young Muslim living in a community where you are surrounded by many uh, Muslim and, and uh, many mosques, and let's say one day the Holy Spirit opens one's heart to believe, uh, <clears throat> do you realize that leaving Islam and becoming a Christian can be a dangerous thing? You're going away from your lifestyle and entire culture into Christianity, into the presence of Christ. And that's why when Reverend Amaru was here and he shared his story with us, we were, some of us were taken aback. Why? Because his life when he became a Christian was forfeit. So was that of his wife. Dangerous times for them when they were converted. So this, is, this ministry of Paul threatens their life style, their income. The trade is intimately related to the worship of Artemis, and this Demetrius cleverly links them in order to stir them up. So here's the point. What are some of the qualities of gospel opposition? Christianity was in the way of what the silversmiths wanted, Material freedom, lifestyle freedom, cultural uh, continuity. That's what they wanted. They wanted their material world. And Paul was threatening it. Opposition to the gospel responds against the gospel because material Wealth, material connection is being threatened. So what shall we pray? We pray that the church might lead the way in rejecting lifestyle freedom. Rejecting, uh, you know, the, the church. The church isn't to be bound up in any culture so that when the culture moves, the church has to move. When the culture says, oh, look, we just discovered that, you know, gay marriage is true. Oh, well, the church says, oh, we'll go along with that. No, 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 no. The church is an entity in submission to Christ, to the glory of God and the benefit of many. We are not pulled around by any culture. We should not be. Gospel opposition is often material. It opposes the truth of the gospel because income is threatened. The culture related to this income is threatened. And that's why we have those who speak out loudly against it. In our culture, you have people who are proponents of abortion and want the industry to continue because it's worth millions and millions of dollars every year. And the church stands up and says, uh-uh, that's the murder of babies. What do you think these folks are going to do? Are they going to say, oh, well, that's your, that's your religious privilege? <laughs> no. We are going to be opposed, and in many ways, because material gain is being threatened. So is the culture of, of uh, flesh, fleshy freedom. So there you have it. What are some of the qualities of opposition? The first one is that opposition can be material. Keep that in mind. Here's the second one. Second one is, is this. Some of the qualities of opposition, the gospel opposition can be material, related to lifestyle and religion. It can be irrational, lacking sound judgment. Note this. And when they heard this, that is the crowd, what Demetrius had said, they were enraged and they were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Oh, here you go. This is the slogan of the day. Paganism always has its slogans. Paganism in the ancient world and in the modern world has its slogans. You know, I forgot to bring one of my birthday gifts. It was a Dr. Seuss book. You're only old once. And I was going to make a point, but I'm not going to do that right now. You make your own point. This, our culture in many ways is like this, slogans. That is 
fill the blank, fill in the blank. You are a fill in the blank. Just the slogans of our culture. Meaningless, mind you, they're irrational. But they're not meant to be. They, they're, they, what they're meant to express is just rage, outcry, outrage. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You people, Paul, and all of you, you're threatening our very culture. You're seeking to destroy. You are, you are, you are. So, carry on. So the city was filled with the confusion. By the way, the Greek word for enraged speaks of this irrational anger boiling over. And it's also filled with confusion. They rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. Anyone who's caught up, they're just gathered up. Oh, these guys are with Paul. Let's take them. Uh, they, they couldn't quite get their hands on Paul, so they went after these guys. Notice this. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. So Paul said to himself, wait a minute. They're talking about this guy. So I'm going in there, and I'm going, to, I'm going to express what truth is. Can you just see Paul doing this? He's not some weak, modern, evangelical celebrity with gelled hair and tight jeans. You can see I have a bit of a bias. So here, it's not that. Paul is for the truth and is willing to be beaten and die for the sake of Christ. He's not into some lifestyle freedom or some integration of lifestyle with a religious form, whether you call it evangelicalism or whatever you call it. But here, here he's willing to give all. And the disciples say, don't do it. They'll kill you, perhaps that was on their mind. And even some of... Uh, of the Asiarchs who were friends of his, they were, they were probably not believers, but they're rulers. They were friends of his. Paul is a friend of sinners. Who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Why? If they're Roman-esque, they would not want disturbances because that would be a black eye on their rule, on their uh, area of service. No, no, no. But they were still friends. And there's that aspect too. But I think more than that would be the maintenance of peace, Pax Romana. And that's not a bad thing. Now some cried out one thing and some for another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Doesn't that sound familiar? When you go to these, uh, when uh, decent journalists go and ask people why they're rioting, you'll have a variety of reasons or, or just a blank stare. Now there's a reason for that, and it's here. Paganism breeds irrationality. Irrational, lacking sound judgment. And then verse 33, some of the crowd promoted or prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, but Alexander motioning with his hand wanted to make a defense to the crowd. A defense of what? I think those scholars who lean in this direction are true. And what is this direction? It is this. Alexander was simply going to get up and to say, look, there's a difference between the Jews and the Christians. So if you want to, want to cause trouble, go after the Christians, but leave us alone. That is likely what was going to be said by Alexander. I don't think he was a friend of Paul. So motioning with his hand, he wanted to make defense to the crowd, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, they were irrational. For about two hours, they, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And again, here is the jargon. Here is the headline. This is what everyone's saying, so we're going to say it. So it's irrational. What are some of the qualities of, of gospel opposition? First of all, opposition has, is, is material in nature. It's always linked to something, like wealth. And linked to that is this cultural 
uh, pagan cultural influence. They're both tied together. They both need each other. And the gospel stands strongly and this feels and the material world of the pagan is threatened. And then it's irrational. The crowd shouting for two hours, droning out anyone who would want to say anything that goes against their position. So we have a wild-eyed mob acting without sound judgment. They are irrational. This isn't a, a gathering to, to a peaceful demonstration by any stretch. This is where people are out of control. So we want to pray that sound thinking might return to our land. Protests that are normal do not burn cities. They don't. Irrational mobs do. So what are some of the qualities of gospel opposition? There is the material aspect, and there is the irrational aspect. Opposition to the church has a dollar sign and a culture firmly attached to it. There are reasons for them to exist in the pagan world, and then there's irrationality. This is, I had an interesting conversation with a, a, a scholar this week. He's going to be publishing a book. It is on the notion of worldview, and uh, it's, it's a little different tact. And this scholar was telling me uh, that um, he wants the book to be published. He has a copy of the manuscript, so I'm going to get the copy, and I'm sure he won't mind other people reading it. Here's the gist. We live in a, a time of great delusion, of great lie, of great deception. Why is the church, why does the church think that it can, through apologetics and rational thinking, minister to an irrational culture? Shouldn't we be about the basics of the faith, proclamating the gospel? It is good that we have ministries of uh, apologetics, and we do need it, but when you live in an irrational, delusional world, how effective is that going to be? So his book will come out, and, and uh, there will be good debate around it. I think he's on to something. The church must be about the gospel, worship, witness, getting out into the communities, sharing Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, hearts to be opened, then we can teach some wonderful truths, but I think that in an irrational culture, and increasingly so, I think it doesn't behoove the church to go down the apologetics road as much as we have. Let us go down the gospel road more and more. So what are some of the qualities of opposition? Material quality, and there's the irrational quality. And thirdly, gospel opposition can be lawless. Verse 35, and when the town clerk, I thank the Lord for town clerks, everybody should. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, one of you got it, you'll get a dime next time. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? In other words, what this guy is saying, now here's the providence of God at work, even through a pagan. This is a pagan leader. This is the town clerk. He would probably be something like a mayor in, in these ancient days. So he would have a lot of influence and, and power in, in Ephesus. So he gets up. He doesn't go along with the crowd. By the providence and sovereignty of God, he says, look, if Artemis is who she says she is and she's known all over the place, you've got nothing to worry about. The myth, isn't the myth everywhere? And then he says, seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. <laughs> And then he says, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. That's true. 
They're not. All they're doing is they are telling the they're telling the gospel, which is the truth, and they're doing it in a God honoring way. They're not. They're not uh, standing out in front of the temple of Artemis and throwing things at it. No, 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 no. They're telling the gospel and strongly. And so what these people are doing is they're breaking the law. They're gathering where they shouldn't be. They're rioting. And they've, they've held these two people who are innocent. If, therefore, Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. There you go. What does he do then? He says, we have a thing called due process. And uh, do you remember that? You know, he's saying, people, there's a thing called due process, and we have it. It's called good order. And so let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. So there you have more of a Supreme Court and uh, that's available too. That's part of good order. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. Although he's a pagan, although he's, no, he's in the Artemis cult, although he may be a wretch, God is using him to do what? To instill good order. Good order. Although we are under pagan rulers, and although they may hate what we love, as long as they regard good order, the church is in good stead. So he's talking about good order. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. These people were lawless. They were operating outside of the established law of the land. And this guy said, you, look, you can't have a society if you have bad law, if you're breaking the law. You can't have it. And that's why as churches, we'll point out when laws are broken, say, well, they're on the books. Aren't we going to obey them? But especially we encourage those who may be pagans and they have a voice to stand up and say, that's what we have on the books. You need to obey it. Sadly, we're in a time when good order or just the due process seems to be something of the past. But we must pray. We must pray. One of the tools that is used against the church is lawlessness. Ignoring that which is on the books of good order and going after the church and trying to undermine it. We have to stand together in prayer and go out from a worship service and bring the gospel. That's the only way that anything is going to change authentically. And even if things get worse... We just do what we've been called to do, worship and witness. We never stop. I can see apologetics. I can see political action. Yeah, I get it, and I'm not disparaging Christians who do that, but, you know, it's time to get down to basics. Worship, witness, particularly when we're being opposed. And what's the nature of gospel opposition? Material, it's irrational, and it's often lawless. So we just need to know that. So what's the key application? What's the plan forward? I don't mind, you know, if Christians want to get on the political issues, that's fine for them. God bless them. And if you want to get on the apologetics bandwagon, fine. We've gone down that road before. God bless you. But this is what I think we need to do. The key word is to endure. Endure. The application today, knowing what is opposed to us, how do we respond? Endurance. That's what Jesus called us to. I think at times like this are so exciting. And uh, 
uh, talking to the to the brothers, you know, just we we just want to go forward. We just want to honor God. And a big part of that is to recognize and to embrace endurance, to suffer without yielding, to bear up, to continue kingdom work to the end. That's where we're going, to continue kingdom work to the end. Not stopping. No, no, sir. No, no, no. We pray for our leaders that they may do well and attend to good order. We pray that they might be saved. But I know that every one of our leaders in this church, and you can be thankful for this, I've heard them say things like, the stoppage of worship, is, that's wrong. That's wrong. We don't stop worship. We don't stop witness. If we have to, we'll go underground and do that. We don't need buildings. We just need Jesus. But we must live in, we must live in this capacity. We live enduring. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to close soon, and uh, I want you to remember the word endure. Matthew chapter 10, verses 16, <clears throat> uh, all the way down through 22, but we'll read a portion. Jesus is talking about let me read verse 16 first. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Like Paul and, and Gaius and Erastus are in the midst of wolves in Ephesus. And we today have plenty of wolves running around. So be wise as serpents and innocent as, as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. Now note this. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So we have confidence in our endurance. Brother will deliver, will deliver brother over to death, and the father is child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Wow. So that which we are saying today is this. Given the opposition to gospel, to the gospel ministry, we're not to shrink. We are to listen to the Holy Spirit. We are to worship and witness. We are to take the name of Jesus with us, even if it costs us our lives. Such is our work. If any entity tells us, I'm sorry, you can't worship anymore, that is against uh, the law because uh, you are, or some version of a made-up law in one's mind, uh, you just can't do that um, and you can't witness anymore because it's offensive. We will say, well, it's still on the books. We can do it. And besides that, it's still on the book in heaven. <laughs> And even if you say we can't do it legally here on earth, we'll go underground and still do it. Worship our Savior and tell the world about him, even at the loss of our lives. That's an endurance ministry. And that's where we must go. Opposition, yes. Endure to the end, yes. Now there's one other thought. <clears throat> If there is someone here who has never received the Lord Jesus, never uh, delighted in him, never thought about him, as Chaplain mentioned just before the uh, first hymn, Christ is in session. He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for the church. If you've never delighted in the person of Christ and now the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, Listen to this. This is the challenge that Jesus brings. This is the gospel. And he brings it in a time, a, a glorious time, when he's just being identified as the Christ by Simon Peter. And then Peter gets put in his place, and Jesus declares this. 
After calling us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow hard, now here's the gospel. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels? One must, by the Holy Spirit, repent of one's self-centered life and put one's trust in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, trust in Jesus, who suffered, died, and rose again and ascended and is at the right hand of the Father now in session. That's his state now, and he's coming. The challenge is to repent. To realize that if you do not trust in Jesus Christ, your life is forfeit for eternity. And that's very sad. May you flee the wrath to come. And by the Holy Spirit, do so and embrace Christ. So that is all. We have one more hymn. And then we shall pray. Chaplain will lead us. And that will close us out for today. <clears throat>